Hey everybody, I'm Madrybred, and this is a quick little tutorial slash first look kind of way of teaching you how to play Thea 2 The Shattering. Uh, the goal of this guide is just to show you enough about the game pretty quickly that you feel confident in being able to play it yourself and learn from there. So I'm going to give you kind of the basic building blocks of this game. I've also done a lot of content on Thea The Awakening, uh, if you prefer the first game. So I've created a fresh file here. We're just going to start the game, a new game. Now, whenever you create a new profile, you'll start with two random gods. Um, it's okay if you don't have the same ones as me. Uh, none of this is going to make a whole lot of sense to you yet until you've really gotten your hands on the game. But generally, uh, the gods will have an ability. We're not going to really be using it here, as well as some god card slots. So we hit next, and this will take us to where we can assign our traits at the beginning of the game. You can see that I already have a bunch assigned here, but you can just get rid of those, and this is what it'll look like for you. It's our ability on the far left from our god, which is mutual love for Lotta, who is who I randomly picked. Again, pick anyone you have. It doesn't really matter too much for the sake of just learning the game. We can have one intellectual thing, as you can see from this icon, a divine one, I believe it's called, as you can see from that icon, and then a bunch of generic ones. We have bonuses here and characters here, and this is what you start with. Um, these aren't going to affect you over the course of the entire game, this is just what you start with, so grab what you have. By default, you're going to have very, very few things just like this. You get god points through successful or unsuccessful runs through the game that you'll use to unlock more things to start off with more of a bonus or more different gods in other playthroughs. So it's not like Civilization where different playthroughs are completely separate from each other. So we only have one uh, puzzle piece intellect one here, which is starting with a scoundrel and a rat, so we'll take that. We have one divine one, which is a gatherer, so we'll take that. I'm happy with those anyway. You can see that uh, there's a two out of seven here, and there's numbers on the character cards. This just means that those numbers can't total over seven, is to keep you from being too overpowered by having too many characters early on. Uh, we already have a gatherer there, so I'll take a craftsman, and I'll take a warrior, and I will take uh, either a scoundrel or a child. Uh, two additional characters, human children. I'm actually going to take the two children, because they can grow up into a multitude of different classes, whereas the scoundrel is generally kind of a weak class. And we have one card slot left, so we can just take one of our bonuses. Uh, pet, crow, and five to ten random gems. I'll take that because I prefer that over a little bit of food and basic equipment. Just because uh, pets are sometimes a little hard to get, and so a pet crow is kind of nice. Again, this stuff doesn't matter too much this early in the game just for learning. So... We are picking our God's Chosen. This is a character that is going to be important for the storyline and is also a character that can be resurrected through the game if they die later. So we get to pick from any of the people we start with to make our God's Chosen. So we have a scoundrel here. We get to have our God's Chosen be a rat. I don't know why you'd do that. It's not very strong. I think we're just going to play it safe. And uh, Apprentice Warrior, Apprentice Hunter. I think we're going to go ahead and take a human warrior and just call him MDB. And that is going to be our God's Chosen. You can pick a portrait here if you want to. We'll go with that guy because he's smug and annoying looking. Okay, so what I did here was I just skipped through his dialogue here. Uh, this is an event screen. He was trying to tutorialize you and tell you a bit about the story, basically. Uh, I can explain it a lot faster than he can. So, this is an event screen. You're going to be getting them constantly through the game as you walk, as you encounter things in the field. It gives you multiple choice um, abilities on choosing how to go through an event. And in the end, you will get items such as 11 wood, 13 meat. You can hover over them and it tells you what they do. You eat meat or you can cook meat, obviously. Wood you could be using for a lot of crafting or building buildings, all kinds of stuff. And at the bottom, you'll see how many research points you get as well as experience points. Experience points are for leveling up your crew, as you could probably guess. Research points are for unlocking new things. Let's close this. So it has generated our randomly generated world here. We're going to hit Q or toggle this. No resources available yet. Okay, sometimes you'll see resources right off the bat. Sometimes you won't. This is our basic game screen here. 
Uh, we can see what turn it is, we can see the season, the time of day, which uh, affects visibility and the aggressiveness of roaming monsters, stuff like this. And this is our expedition. We can split this into multiple expeditions if we'd like to, but early on you probably want to keep the whole group together. As we left click, we can see that we have all kinds of little menus here, uh, but a faster way to go through this is just hit I on your keyboard for inventory, and you can go through it from here. Uh, when you're just walking around, you just have the three um, the three slots available here to you of food and fuel management. I recommend at the start of every single game, you turn off allow source of new fuel and you turn off everything that's not just basic wood. You need to burn fuel to be able to heal at your campfire and everything and to gather at a reasonable rate. Uh, but in general, you don't want to burn more valuable resources like say coal or better forms of wood unless you have to. So I would always recommend turning all of them off but wood and turning off allow use of new fuel. New food though, let them eat whatever they want for the most part. The more different things that they eat and of higher quality, the more bonuses they'll get along here. But that's kind of advanced stuff. You don't need to worry about that right now. Inventory will show us all of our people as well as all of our items. If we wanted to, we could drag people over here and make a second expedition. We don't want to right now. Lastly, we have our equipment page here. We can see all of our people on the right here, as well as really quick overview on what equipment they have. You can also click this little button here if you want to see the full portraits, which is kind of cool, as well as their stats on the side and everything. But if you just click on people's faces, you can see their stats and everything. And we'll go into exactly what these mean a little bit later in this tutorial when it has a little bit more meaning to you. We can see our equipment over here. We have a crow, the best companion for a witch. And you can see it gives the passive effects of helping you with perception and rituals and has a pet crow ability in battle. If we right click to view details, we can hover over things and see what everything does, which is cool. Improves um, perception and rituals. So not the most interesting thing in the world, but we'll drag it on to MDB for now in his pet slot. You can see you have two hands, he has a two-handed sword here. You have an armor slot, you have a tool slot, an accessory slot, and a pet slot. It's uh, much more simplified in comparison to Thea 1, which had tons of different stats and tons of different pieces of equipment. This makes it much easier to manage a big group, I find. We don't need to mess with their equipment too much right now anyway. It's not like we have a whole lot of equipment, but we will soon. So what we want to do is select our group here and we're going to hold down right click and we can see where we can move. You can see we have four movement right now, four movement points remaining, nine days of food or nine turns of food rather, and 28 turns of fuel. So let's start exploring a little bit. We can see some fruit right there. The season we started in, by the way, is summer. Gathering grants a little bit of experience each turn is a bonus. There's possible weather conditions that we'll get into as we get there. And there's some fruit over there. Best gathering season, spring and summer. Sweet, that's perfect. So if we need some more food, we could gather there. So I think I'll end my turn here. Unlike in the first game, it doesn't take uh, any movement to set up camp. So if we just select our people here, we're at a movement, we can hit C to start our camp. Now we have many more uh, tabs available to us. So let's go through them all very quickly. Your top one is your overview. This is mostly going to be important once you build yourself a village rather than now, but it gives you a quick overview of just everything we saw before. Buildings and ships, we don't have any. Tasks that you have available, stuff like that. Management, you've seen that. You know inventory, you know equipment. We're gonna go down to gathering. So this will have a list of all the resources that are next to us that we can gather. Right now it's just fruit. Uh, it takes 90 crafting points to get one bushel of 10 fruit, and we have 14. That's what all these numbers here mean. You can see over here the gather rate of each of our characters is determined by their stats. Naturally, the guy with the highest here is a gatherer. You can see on this little character sheet breakdown here, he has a big pickaxe picture right next to his level. The pickaxe represents that that is a human gatherer, so that's what he excels at, is gathering. Um, and it also shows here, he's also got a little bit of skill in crafting rituals and researching, but mostly he's really great at, uh, at gathering. You can either drag them over to these slots, or if you just click on the plus symbol, it'll automatically put whoever is next in line who's best there uh, for ease. 
You can see here that we need 90 gathering points to get a bushel of 10 fruit. We get 127 a turn with these two, so it'll take one turn. And the points will carry over into uh, the next amount of fruit. Next, we have our crafting tab here. We can see who here is good at crafting. Mostly this lady. You can see the anvil, so she is a crafter. If we start a new task, um, we know how to make a few pieces of equipment right here, as well as some basic buildings. So crafting is a huge part of this game, so here's how this works. Uh, let's look at gathering tools right off the bat, because we don't know how to make very much right now. We require a primary material and a second ma secondary material. And how good the thing we're making is will depend on what we use here. So, you can see for the primary material, we need either 18 of a kind of leather, any kind of leather, 16 of any kind of wood, 14 of any kind of gemstone, or a smaller quantity, 11 of any kind of leather. Then you also need a secondary, which it looks to be, for gathering tools at least, is the same things, but in smaller quantities. So if we were to just do wood and wood, we have enough wood that we could do that. This would make us a quite low quality gathering tool. Uh, gatherer's aid, you can see when equipped, it would give you two gathering bonus, which is actually not horrible this early in the game. However, we could pick a different skill. We could pick instead of a gatherer's aid, we could have a forager's aid, which instead is a percent based um, gathering bonus, which might equal to more than just a gatherer's age if you put aid if you put on someone who's already really good. Whereas a gatherer's aid might be better if you put on someone who's not very good at gathering to get them those few points to get it started. Worth pointing out here, it says uh, plus two gathering. That seems like it's nothing if you're thinking about it as you need oh 90 points for this two is nothing. Um, in reality, you know we have 33 points here on him, and. Uh, that's all coming out of having 3.3 gather skill as well as some of his stats here. So if we if we right click there, nope, game didn't want me to, there we go. If we right click there, we can see gathering here and it shows how the math breaks down on this. It's coming through his other stats as well giving him his gathering. So each point of gathering you have translates to 10. So, you know, two gathering seems like nothing, but in reality that's giving you 20 gather points extra uh, every single turn, that actually equals a decent amount. So you give that to someone like a rat who has almost no gathering, and that gives him a lot more gathering. That'd make him as good at gathering as MDB here. So that's how the gathering uh, breaks down. Same with crafting, ritual, research, any of those. You can see we can make crafting tools. We just don't have the resources to right now. Or the other ring. That is complicated, very complicated accessory. We won't worry about that right now. You also have a buildings tab under crafting here for when you want to make buildings. This is mostly a thing for after you've created your village. However, this is how you create your village. Later in the game, when we want to create a village and have kind of a hub area to do all of our stuff and to really get the advanced stuff going, we're going to be using our cosmic seed that we start with as our secondary material. And we could use wood or bone or gemstone or regular stone to build it. The higher quality stuff you use, the better quality idol you'll build in the center of your village and thus give you better bonuses. And you can learn how to replace that idol later with a better quality one once you get better quality stuff to build it out of. Next, we have our cooking and composite. Uh, tab here. Right now, all we can do is cook, but we can learn how to kind of smelt materials and stuff later. You can see that's not available right now. Right now, all we can do is cook sweet meats. So we need a meat and something sweet. So we could use meat and fruit, for instance, make baked food. The foods, they're, um, they're worth more uh, in terms of selling if you'd like to trade it with other people. They weigh less, so they weigh down your party less if you want to carry them out in an expedition, giving you more room to carry loot. And I, I believe in Thea 2, they also give you more bonuses towards your next, um, your next food-based bonus, as I explained earlier. And research, this will make some more sense later, but you can always do a little bit of research here to gain a research point. We can see we're two out of eight on the way to the next advancement point, which will make sense in a moment. In general, a bit of research is quite a weak research to do. Lastly, we have rituals here. 
By default, we have spiritual healing to restore part of people's faith through basically a crafting recipe with a bunch of people put in. Different rituals can have different effects depending on what you use in them, and you can lock more rituals later. Now that we have a general overview of this, what is the game like exactly? Well, uh, let me just double check here. We are gathering that, right? Yes. Then we're going to hit enter to end our turn. So we'll give that a second. And yes, 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 we don't need your tutorial, but thank you for the research points. We just gained uh, our 10 fruit there, as you can see down there. It's a little tooltip just letting you know that, hey, you gathered that. So, up here you'll see that we have advancement points. This looks very complicated. Let's go to a less complicated looking screen. Here we go. Advancement points are gathered every time you get enough research points through events or through researching. And advancement points can be spent on unlocking things. So we have the rituals and buildings tab here. We could unlock buildings for when we have a village or rituals down here. We could unlock advancements in food, the ability to cook more things like goblins recipes or grandma's treats. And you can see these are different primary and secondary uh, ingredients. So you can make a wider variety of things. Crafting, so that we can craft different kinds of things. We could learn how to craft armors, for instance. At level one, you'd be able to craft heavy, medium, and leather robes, but only with the primary level one and secondary level one. So you can use these and these. Whereas as you get farther in on these, you can become more of an expert in individual trees to use uh, primaries and secondaries of the second rank or the third rank if you get to the third part. And that'll give you more flexibility to make better things and to use more different kinds of resources. So you can see that there's a very wide variety of things you can create here. And when you imagine that you can also um, have different abilities on things based on what ingredients you use, say if you make a scroll, you know, it's going to turn out different if you use some kind of basic leather to make the scroll. Or if you were to use some kind of advanced gemstone, you could come out with very different um, very different uh, effects on your weapons or your armor and stuff like that. And so there's a lot of variety there. If you hover over them also, they'll give you a general breakdown. You know, axes are pretty fast, medium damage. Uh, a, a polearm, medium speed, low damage. But it deals damage in a row or ranged attack. It depends on what it is exactly. These will make more sense once we get in a fight. And lastly, probably most importantly, we have resources. We have this big resource tree. You, what you do is you, you spend advancement points when you find a resource out there to be able to gather that resource from the field rather than just getting it from random drops or trade and stuff. So if we explore a little more, uh, before very long, we should be finding a resource. Here we go. Here's a great example. Clay. It's all grayed out. We can't gather the clay yet. But if we look at our um, breakdown here, we can see clay is right here. It's under the stone tree. Not the most glamorous, but very versatile and commonly used in crafting. Yeah, clay was very powerful in Thea of the Awakening, which was the previous game. So if we wanted to, we could purchase through our advancement point the ability to gather it right now from the field. And uh, those resource points on the ground, by the way, never go away. They never run out. Uh, you'll also receive immediately 10 units of the resource. You'll notice some of these resources have a little icon on them, either wild or improved, by the way. Some gatherers, or crafters rather, will have an affinity for either wild stuff or improved stuff, and thus they'll have a better chance of making good or bad equipment with that stuff based on what they specialize in. As you start to advance down the tree, you can see things get more expensive. This requires two points, three points, three points, stuff like that. Uh, as you get to rare and rare resources, it'll also unlock the ability to see rare resources as you go down the tree. So, uh, right now I'm not going to spend any of those advancement points. We're at zero movement, so I'm just going to camp and gather a little bit of meat. Ah, don't have enough gathering points to get it all in one turn. That's a shame. What I will do, though is do I have the stuff to make a crafting tool on me right now? I don't. I need a little bit of metal or stone, gemstone, more metal. Do I see any of that right now? I don't, but I'll probably find some soon. That's fine. I'll just end the turn and keep walking. So I want to get into an encounter now. 
so that I can show you exactly how they work. So we're gonna explore a little bit more. Here we go. So I just ended a, tur a turn here and we got a random encounter. You discover the ruins of an ancient human cemetery. So you get to pick a few th different things you can do here. I'm gonna just search the place. So I'm gonna hit one on my keyboard or you can click it. Ambushed by bog buys that has its layer here. I don't know what that is. Uh, a lot of this game's mythology is based in Slavic mythology, of which I am mildly acquainted with. So this is a level one physical challenge, as you can see here from the red cards. There's three different kinds of challenges that we'll get into in a moment. So it's one enemy, here's our group. So whenever you get into an encounter, um, a, a big complaint about the previous game is that you get bogged down a lot in the card game fights. And so you'd want to auto resolve a lot, but sometimes you just get annihilated on auto resolve and you feel like you shouldn't have. This game has an inter interesting system. I recommend you always click auto resolve first to see what the game thinks. The game thinks that if I were to do this automatically, I'd have a perfect victory. No one would get hurt. Basically, that's the game's way of saying, there's no possible way this guy could hurt you. And so you may as well just have it auto win the fight. But I'm going to resolve it manually to show you how to do these card games. Uh, but there are other results here, like, you know, winning with injuries, winning with serious injuries, winning with, vic with grave injuries, or just total defeat. We're going to do the fight. And don't show again. That was a tutorial because I made a new, um, I made a new profile for this to make this as basic as possible. So this is what every single challenge is going to look like. Some variation of this. You can see his side of the field, my side of the field. Sword represents melee, bow represents it's ranged. So we have one action point, which is like this little gear kind of icon. And we're in the first phase of combat. So we start with one gear. And here is all of our villagers that we have with us right now. To play any of them would cost one action point right now. So this is a physical challenge, a melee challenge. I'm going to open with my uh, my warrior right here, MDB. So if we click on him, we can see his different things that we can tell him to do. So we can tell him to weapon attack, throw a poison dagger, or brute force. And you can see it gives you the breakdown on how these work. Uh, brute force here on the right, we can see the timer, which is the delay of the fight. You want this to be as low as possible to be able to act faster. You can see the trigger of this is melee. It attacks in the melee range. Basically, right in front and beside him is his priority target, single target melee, and the damage that it should deal. We can see that if we did the poison dagger, though, we could be in the back row. It's a ranged attack. Range attacks, you can actually target directly who you want to attack, by the way, rather than it being random based on who's close to them. We do six damage, poison damage. So if the target has less than maximum HP, so they're bleeding essentially, it'll do more damage to an already wounded person. And this is a horizontal slash. This is going to be based on his weapon. So it hit two people standing to the left and right in front. So it's a little bit of an arc. So I'm just going to throw him right there in the middle and end turn. They have their two action points. All they can place is their monster they have there. And it's back to our turn again. You can see that thing there has 26 health, does about seven damage with the attack they want to do, melee range. This is really no danger. So here's an interesting mechanic of the game. I could play MDB again for two action points this time. And the way that works is I'll just place him there. And he has a little duplicate icon here. This is to say that he is acting twice, but it is actually the same person. If he were to get attacked here, both of them would take damage. It's the same person. If this card were to die, uh, well, this one's taken off the field as well. It's just the same guy acting twice. And because the reason you'd want to do this is to get more out of a really useful unit or to just act really, really quickly with one guy that you'd normally be playing again later. You can see the turn order here. He's going before us just because it's such a fast monster. And then we're going to be acting twice based on this delay. You have more of a delay the later you play your cards. You can see this is a four delay. This is a plus six delay, but we're getting more action points as we go. So let's just kind of haphazardly throw a few more people on. Some poison dagger guy there, sure. 
She has a wand? No, she has a, a mace. I'd rather not throw her right in the front there. Um, we actually don't have many people who can do any range attacks here. Here we go. Hurry up. Decrease the delay of a selected ally is one of his abilities. I'm going to cast that on MDB. There we go. And we got his first attack to be before their first attack by doing that. We're out of, um, we're out of action points there. They casted something there. That actually went so fast I didn't notice. I had the game speed up a little bit high. Sorry about that. I will turn that down in a moment for you. Uh, and we will summon creature. Just summon a boar there as a bit of a meat shield. If it dies, we lose our boar, which is kind of a shame, but it's mostly meant to be a meat shield. So we're going to end turn there. And now it's the battle phase, so we get to sit back and watch as everybody's going to go in the order up here and start attacking their targets. Let's slow down the game speed there so you can follow this better. In fact, let's make it real slow. There we go, so we can see he is attacking him. It hit. It also hits what's next to it, which is no one. He took the 12 damage. Battle over. Defeat of the enemy, search for his place. We got a little bit of blood bone, which is a better quality bone than regular bone. Fur leather, a little bit better than regular leather. And we actually got a wolf that has decided that we're the alpha. So we have, uh, that's actually like an item, basically. And we lost a little bit of health on MDB. As you can see on the breakdown here, and in fact, let's go to the full one so I can use my mouse to show you things. We have 25 out of 31 health. We got banged up a little bit. Um, right now, we mostly have spiritual armor, which is kind of funny. That's based on our equipment. In fact, a bright mind, which is mental shielding. And poor mood. He's not in a very good, uh, he doesn't have very good morale right now, which is unfortunate. That is how events work, though. Now, what stats you use bringing into an event depends on what kind of event. There's physical ones. There's also mental ones and spiritual ones. So maybe a witch would be really good at a, uh, at a spiritual one, whereas a scholar might be really good at a mental one. But each person is going to have their own things they can do in each kind of event. In Thea 1, there was like nine different kinds of challenges, and you'd never remember which one of the 500 stats matched up to which ones. This one is broken down much easier. You can very clearly see what your health bar is in each thing. There's health, sanity, faith, and they all act as their own health bars for their own things. Now, uh, I don't believe that was enough experience to level up, and I really want to show you how a level up works, because that will really help you wrap your head around how stats work in this game. So we're gonna keep exploring a little bit. We're actually gonna to wanna to drop off over here for some food. As you can see, we only have five turns left and here we go. We have another event here. So do we wanna go the light or harmony path or the intellect or nature path? Well, our goddess is one of harmony and intellect. So we could probably go either path and be okay. Your god does shape how some of these events go. I'm gonna go with intellect and nature. There we go. Ooh, that's a creepy looking thing right there. Slowly move away as soon as you see the sun's rays full of odd creatures. So they're trying to dominate us. Yeah, greater clarity of mind to resist the attack. So there's a two challenge, challenge physical, a one challenge spiritual, and a one challenge mental. We can view our group down here to get a quick overview of what is it that we're good at. Um, just at a glance here, looking at our, our faith and our sanity, it seems like overall we're much better with sanity, so we want to do a mental challenge. We shall not be broken, our minds will, rep will repel these fiends. And if we were to auto-resolve, it thinks we can rock this thing. Again, if you ever have perfect victory, I recommend you just accept that outcome, but for the sake of teaching you the minigames, we'll begin. And I know how it works. Okay, so you can see it's a much bigger field this time. It's a wider field. The terrain is bigger this time. And so their opening, you can see it's a, it's literally a picture of a brain, which is kind of funny, eccentricity of the game. And you can see it's basically the same card game, except the stats are um, affecting different parts. You can see like damage four, damage three, like these are different numbers. We have different abilities, and that's because the stats play into it in different ways. Our heavy hitters now are people who are intelligent. We have a gatherer here who's quite intelligent. He also has poison throwing daggers. I think I actually want to open with him in the back row. Our enemies played first, by the way, so they have less delay, but they had less action points to open with. And I'm going to throw 
Uh, this scoundrel up in the front row. Brute Force is not the strongest move in the game, as you can see, four damage, but he has pretty high sanity. I want him to take the brunt of the attacks. They played in their back row. They got a poison damage ranged attack going on. They get to, they're selecting a single enemy and doing four damage. This one melee attack, four damage. None of that is threatening. I can see why the game thinks that we're just gonna rock this encounter. Show off single target attack and stuns, which causes delay. I like that. So that's gonna be a melee attack on someone that will give them more delay and push them farther into the turn queue. And really, again, we can't really lose this fight. This fight is so heavily in our favor. So if anything, this is going to be just a way of you guys being able to see exactly how this works. That right there, Strength of Swarm, okay. Catches attributes increase as other allies are placed onto the field. Okay, after them. That's what that was. And I'm just gonna turn again, it doesn't matter. I don't care if I have points unused. Okay, so let's just have it on slow so you can kind of follow with your eyes here. So he attacked first with his dagger, it hit this brain, which that's a duplicate, so they both got hurt. It attacked that there. He's attacking up here. You can see the four damage. And so you can see like, you know, this is why I play on a high speed. I'm just used to it. I can follow it pretty easily. And you can see the game speed is down here, this little bar that you can move. So let's put it to neutral again, and you can see it has sped up quite a bit. Some abilities will allow you to manually target whatever you like, which is a pretty powerful ability, actually, for folks firing down uh, individual enemies. Resolving battle, phase two. And if, ev if uh, one side is still alive, by the way, or if rather both sides are still alive, after the second phase of the battle, everybody replays their cards. So it's not gonna just keep going Rochambeau until one side wins. All right, we've 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 basically won this. There we go. There we go, beautiful. We got some mythical leather, which is a decent quality leather for winning this encounter. You can read that if you'd like to. And we also got a little bit of a mental blessing on a bunch of our people to increase our wisdom and intellect. That's awesome. And we get our research points and our experience points there as well. Was that all of our movement? Uh, almost, but I actually wanna camp there and get a little bit of fruit because we're quite hungry. And we'll end there. There's a little bit more I wanna show you before I feel like you could just play the game yourself and be able to understand everything. Uh, we got an advancement point there, that's nice. I wanna get a level up and I wanna find a certain couple things. So I might fast forward a little bit until we see it. Oh, there's an enemy on the field, there we go. First time seeing this, I think. Uh, we can see it's a level one challenge enemy. They're gonna move around when we end our turn here. Sometimes they attack you, sometimes they don't. This one attacked us. It's one snake, victory with injuries. I'll just accept that outcome. One guy took a slight amount of damage. He'll heal as we camp, it'll be fine. We can see that there is some kind of event over here. So let's go ahead and go up to that. Scaled leather over there. I like the look of those lizards. Here we go. So these are things that you're gonna be looking for. Uh, search the ruins despite the likely danger. And we got a little bit of sandstone, which is a very low quality stone, but there's some kind of spirit that's trying to get in. We're gonna resist it and victory with injuries. Sure, we'll take it for the sake of speeding this up. You resisted it and were able to move away. Sweet. Experience, research points, we're good. Here we go. This is one of the things I was looking for is another faction. Beast approach. Some ravens. These, again, level one encounters, and we started with a warrior on our team, so we're pretty much okay. One person got slightly hurt, got some eggs we can cook with. Here's another thing I wanted, actually. This is perfect. They're all happening at once. A level up. A bunch of our people just leveled up this turn. If we click, we can see the level up screen here. So, every level up... Um, it will go back and forth between learning a new ability, which will be either getting better at crafting or rituals or something like that, or an ability they can use in battle, like some kind of spell or a way of attacking or defending themselves. They'll go between learning that 
on every, I believe it's on every odd number of level, they'll learn one of those. And on every even level, you will learn a one of three uh, stat boosts. So there's always going to be the one on the far left that gives you two, or you could pick to get one in something else. And you get to pick what you have here. So if we hover over, we can see this is a scoundrel. We're kind of jack of all tradesy, although I guess we're best here at mental stuff, which is the yellow stuff. So wisdom might not be a bad idea. Secondary mental attribute affects luck, rituals, crafting, gathering, and sanity, which is your mental health. We can do destiny, or we could do plus two in mysticism. Uh, I like the idea of just focusing my strengths here, so I'm gonna go with wisdom. This person is gatherer. You can also see that he is quite intelligent. He's actually got a lot of perception, which is nice. And I think I will have him focus on that because he can get two in it. It does increase his gathering and he's a gatherer. So I want him to be really good at that. She is very strong, actually, which is interesting and incredibly wise. I might want to just stack that wisdom. It would help her crafting. Uh, although health is always nice as well as carry limits. I think I will have her go wisdom to really stack on top of the high wisdom she has and make her a really good crafter. MDB here, he is our warrior. We really want to get him physically powerful. I wouldn't mind perception because it does affect his luck and his health, his secondary physical attribute. So we'll do that for the health. It's a physical attribute. Uh, this child here, uh, what was she again? Apprentice warrior. So she is likely to grow up to be a warrior, but she could end up being other things, but she's physically inclined. I think I will give her perception then for her health. Maybe she'll grow up and be a hunter in the end. Who knows? This person is an apprentice hunter. Okay. And I will also give them perception then because they're an apprentice hunter and being perceptive is important. There we go. That was their level up. And I want to go interact with these guys over here. As you can see up here, we actually have a, where is it? I'm blind. How many factions and loyalty? This is diplomacy. We haven't met these guys yet, the Slavian. We haven't met them yet. So we're gonna walk in and meet them. You best move along. You're no friends of ours. There's a little bit of voice acting in this game. Unfortunately, it's not as much as Thea the Awakening, but what can you do? So we can either attack them, challenge five, or challenge three mental. Say that you mean no harm. All you want to do is talk and visit. Now, these guys are probably going to beat us in this challenge and just tell us beat it, you know? Total defeat? Yeah, it thinks we're going to get annihilated. Uh, and we probably will. Some villages are really easy to deal with on this. A challenge three is too much for us right now. So I'll try and play this out a little bit, but... The chance of us actually succeeding here is very low. I was hoping for an easier challenge. Oh, no, 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 we're doomed. <laughs> I forfeit. Yeah, a bunch of people lose some sanity. They didn't like that they told us to go away. We'll just leave. We're okay. Uh, but a bunch of people lost sanity, so we, we do need to camp and let it regenerate a bit. Spot a spider nest nearby. Uh, beast, communicate with the nest. I will rather leave that. So... What we could have gained there is uh, we could have become friends with them and being able to trade with them. Unfortunately, it was not meant to be, apparently. It's always worth checking villages, though, because sometimes the challenge is quite a bit lower than that. In practice earlier today, they only had four people, and so I was able to pretty easily beat that challenge with who I started with. Although I did pick some different cards and had a little bit more mental skill, which is what's used in conversation like that. So there's one other thing that I feel like I really want to show you before we end this little tutorial. So allow me to just fast forward a little bit until I find it. Here we go, we found it. A terrain artifact. So terrain artifact, let's get a little bit of strength on a rat there. A terrain artifact is something that you can research that uh, reveals a very interesting mechanic of this game, which is the Theopedia. If you go into Theopedia here, we have an enemy index where we have little indexes, it says, of, of all the creatures we found, and it gives you a little bit of info on them. It says, research material collected and research completed. 15% power bonus when auto-resolving challenges versus this creature. We can research things on creatures and get a bonus towards easily defeating them. That is very valuable. One of the ways to get this 
to, to learn about this stuff. And also it's a good way to get advancements, especially if you don't have a village yet, and thus you don't have a really good way of studying. Camp. Uh, so what we're gonna do is camp right here because our food is really poor right now. We're gonna, we're gonna gather, uh, what's easy to gather? The fish or the meat, they're the same? Okay. We'll do that. It says 23 turns. We're gonna get a little bit of food and then switch over to having the good people on terrain artifact. What we're gonna do is research a terrain artifact. Researching a terrain artifact gets us info that we can then study to have terrain info or, um, or animal info to give us bonuses towards killing those animals on auto resolve. Uh, are we eating this new food? Yes, we just don't have nearly enough food. All right, we're probably gonna start taking a little bit of starvation damage, but for the sake of the tutorial, we're playing a little reckless and that's okay. The train artifact will also become a rarer resource as soon as we're actually done researching it. So let's fast forward a little bit until we have uh, this done. Oh, and uh, pausing here real quick, the fast forward that is, uh, we got another level up. So you can see we can learn some new abilities here. So we get to pick between uh, Strength of the Swarm, more rats, more problems, uh, which is Inspire, decrease delay of selected action. Okay. And we also have uh, Trash Throw. Go to gathering stuff, but if needed, they can toss it at the enemy too, which is a ranged attack and also has the passive ability of giving you some gathering skill. I will take that. And poison throwing dagger or brute force, poison throwing dagger. Okay, back to it. Okay, we have it researched now. So we've unlocked, uh, we've seen what it is. We found Topaz, which is a gemstone resource right up there. Topaz, improved resource type. And, ooh, uh, I will take toughness on my warrior. And if we go to the Theopedia now, uh, oh right, no, it's, uh, we go into our camp, and if we go to the research page now, terrain, one, we have one terrain research we can do. We don't have anyone who's a really good researcher, unfortunately, but as we can see, we get 30 advancement points for researching this, which is really nice considering we need two more to get to the next advancement. That's probably gonna be multiple advancement points. So that's a big way that you're going to be researching in the future. Real quick before we end this little tutorial type thing though, uh, the other thing that you might need to know is you'll notice on the map that there's all kinds of different islands all over the place. If you go to your crafting menu, uh, so we go to, oop, let me find my group again. I know there's a hotkey for that. I just don't remember what it is, unfortunately. Um, if we go to our crafting and buildings, we can make little rafts and boats and stuff. That's how you get to other islands and they'll have different resources and stronger, weaker enemies and stuff like that. So um, that's my tutorial video. I hope that you found this useful. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments. I read all the comments I have done for like nine years or something now. And so I'll try my best to get back to you and answer any questions that you have if I know the answer. And I'll probably be streaming this game a bunch over my Twitch TV page, which is linked in the description. If you ever want to catch me live and see me not playing this and yell at me to play this, and then I'll play this for you. Uh, I love playing Thea, The Awakening. I'd love to play Thea 2, The Shattering for you. And I like to name all the characters in the game after the chat so we can all get overly emotionally involved as soon as we die. Thank you everybody so much for watching. And until next time, have a nice day.